All right, I too want to thank you all for being so faithful this week and being here this afternoon. It's a long day. We've got one session to go. We have some good things to talk about. And for whatever you gave in the offering, thank you very much. I often don't know how it came out, but so far the Lord has provided, so thank you. And I want to thank, to, uh, thank Rudy and Jenny for putting up with us for another week. Um, you know, they say relatives that stay more than three days. <laughs> the first time we were coming up here a year ago, we, uh, I got, I actually scheduled a bed and breakfast, or an Airbnb, and uh, Rudy drove by and said, you don't want to stay there. <laughs> Come to our house. So we did. So the only thing we missed is when we did the Reading Church in 2019, we didn't stay at your house. We missed out big time. <laughs> Hoping to be back again sometime before too long. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we are delighted to be in your house again and opening your word again. And we ask for your blessing on our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. For one more time, let's say our mantra together. It's not about what you do. It's about who you know. And who you know will transform what you do. Everything in the Christian life revolves around the daily decision to spend personal intimate relation time with Jesus, time in the word, eating the spiritual food, time in prayer, breathing the spiritual breath, and then living out, sharing and serving passing out the good fruit the Lord is growing in our lives. I want to challenge you once again, every day when you finish your prayer at the close, or when you finish, when you pray at the close of your devotional time, ask God this simple question, please open my eyes today to specific opportunities that you arrange where I can make a difference in someone's life for you, Jesus, and for your kingdom. And give me a nudge when it happens so that I don't miss it. We've done a lot of redefining this week. Um, a week ago this afternoon, we did a big thing on a redefinition of sin. Sin is not primarily bad deeds, broken behavior. Sin is a broken trust relationship that results in broken behavior. So the basic definition of sin is a broken relationship with Jesus, which results in sinning bad behavior. You don't solve the bad behavior by attacking the bad behavior. You solve the bad behavior symptom by attacking the root problem of the broken relationship. Sinning is simply, essentially, not abiding in Jesus. Sin is lawlessness. We saw that lawlessness is best defined as not abiding in Jesus, broken relationship. Uh, the great commandment in the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbors yourself. Notice lawfulness is defined as love, which is a relational word. Romans 13.10 says, love is the fulfilling of the law. So when you are loving, you're fulfilling all the law. And Romans 14.23 says, whatever is not from faith is sin. So anything we're doing outside of an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, even if it's good behavior, is a life of sin. We looked at a definition of justification. Justification is simply restored trust relationship, renewed abiding. We reconnect. We get instant forgiveness for all brokenness. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. When you have the son, you have life. It's reconnecting with the son who is life. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The moment... We fess up to being sinners and look to him for our solution. We are cleansed. And we noted that justification is by faith alone. It's all Jesus. Amen? We've looked at, just, at sanctification. And that was Wednesday night. Sanctification is simply growth in trust relationship, deeper daily abiding. 
ongoing healing of brokenness that results in restored behavior. As you receive Christ, justification, so walk in him, sanctification. It's all Christ. We noted this is the work of God that you what? Believe or trust in him, him whom he has sent. Our work is on belief, not behavior. Fight the good fight of faith, not the bad fight of sinful behavior. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is about knowing Jesus and that evidently solves the rest. <clears throat> I am the vine, you are, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, <clears throat> that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Notice abiders bear fruit, and fruit bearers get pruned. If we abide, everything else happens. And we noted, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus as Lord, walk in him. Receiving him, justification, walking in him, sanctification. Renewed trust, deeper daily trust. Renewed abiding, deeper daily abiding. And we also noted then that I believe the solution to the whole issue is that sanctification is as much by faith alone as his justification. He does all the character transformation I simply sit at his feet and give him time to do that surgery in my life because his word is like a sharp two-edged sword, sharper than any uh, two-edged sword. It can, it can uh, discern between the thoughts and intents of the heart. When we read God's word, that is his scalpel going into our lives and doing his divine surgery, which doesn't leave us carved up, it leaves us whole. I gave you this little chart once, I want you to see it once more. Both sanctification and justification are by faith alone in Jesus. Justification is forgiveness. What kind of forgiveness? Super forgiveness, such that we're treated as though we never sinned. Sanctification is holiness. Justification is the new birth. We get life. We come to life. Sanctification is new life, living that life. Justification is reconciliation. Sanctification is transformation. Justification is acceptance by God. Trans sanctification is obedience to God. Justification is what saves me. Sanctification is what changes me. Justification is what God does for me. Sanctification is what God does to and in me. Justification gets me into heaven and sanctification gets heaven into me. And both are necessary. They are different in purpose, but the same in method. I do one thing, he does two. I seek Jesus daily to know him in an intimate personal relationship, to know Jesus is eternal life, John 17, 3. He does 100% of both justification and sanctification. He is my justification and sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. They are both necessary. Without holiness, you will not see God. And Jesus guarantees the outcome from the start. You let him begin a good work, he will bring it to completion. All right? I get with Jesus, justification. I stay with Jesus, walk with Jesus, sanctification. All by faith alone, I seek him. He does all the rest. Glorification is natural, perfect trust. I look forward to the day when I will not have to work at a relationship with Jesus. I will have perfect natural trust and perfect natural behavior, restored face-to-face -face relationship. In my Father's house are many abodes. I will live, abide forever with him. So sin is not abiding. Justification is renewed abiding. <clears throat> Sanctification is ongoing abiding. And glorification is forever abiding. Got that? We talked about how to keep this relationship going. We talked about the three-legged stool, time with Jesus in Bible, reading, prayer, and then letting it bubble over in sharing. At, we looked at it at three levels. Number one, there's the level of your personal relationship with Jesus. If you don't have that, you ain't got nothing. And then there's the level we talked about this morning at Sabbath school time of the small group where you have some intimate friends, a dozen or so, um, that you walk with Jesus with once a week and spend time with um, having devotions with Jesus together. And then, if you have those two in place, the big church Sabbath morning celebration will just be a big bubbling over 
and everybody will be spilling on everybody else and there will be just lots of good stuff going around. This afternoon, we want to ask one final question. It's a question that seems almost silly to ask. Is Jesus enough? It seems almost blasphemous to give anything but a hearty yes, of course. But invariably, when this message is preached, somebody says, yeah, but. A few years ago, a bunch of years ago, probably close to 15 now, I preached through the Gospel of John at the Glendale Church, and it took me four years and about four months to get through it. We had about 140 sermons on the Gospel of John. It was a wonderful trip. When we got in the middle of that to John chapter 16, I remember one week I came to this passage. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper, the parakletos, the one called to be alongside you, will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him. And when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they are not trusting in me. Of righteousness because I go off to my father and you are no longer perceiving me. Of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I remember I was preparing a sermon on that. And I got all excited because I'd heard Morris Vanden preach on this many years before. And I realized, as I pointed out, I think it was last evening, <clears throat> that notice when the Holy Spirit preaches this sermon on sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, there's a three-point sermon. You know, you often hear about a three-point sermon. It's kind of, you don't want a five-point, they won't remember it, you know, and three's about right. And so here you've got a sermon. If I were to say to you, Next week, you're the preacher, and this is your topic. I want you to preach on this passage, sin, righteousness, and judgment. May I suggest that it would be awfully easy to say, well, let's see. What, about, what do I want to say about sin? Sin is what we're supposed to stop doing, right? And point out all the things or some of the things that we need to stop doing. You know, gossiping and, you know, pride, and I suppose we get in some moral areas, you know. And then the second part of the sermon is righteousness. Well, that's what you're supposed to start doing, right? Talk about the good deeds we need to be doing. So we need to stop doing this and start doing that. And then the third section of the sermon is on the judgment. You better get with it because the judgment's coming. So you have stop this, start that, and motivation. Doesn't that sound pretty biblical? And yet it says the Holy Spirit will preach on sin. It doesn't say a word about bad behavior. Of sin because they're not trusting in me. Defining sin relationally, the Holy Spirit does it. And of righteousness because I go off to my Father and you're no longer perceiving me. How do we see Jesus when Jesus is gone? Through the Holy Spirit. Who is our righteousness? Jesus. How do we get righteousness? Look to Jesus. Not a word about good behavior. And then judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Doesn't say anything about you and I standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, those verses are in the Bible, but it's not here. So whatever the Spirit wants to say in this three-point sermon, it doesn't have anything to do with bad behavior, good behavior, or quaking before the judgment. We've almost preached the end-time judgment like it's double, double jeopardy. I got forgiven when I confessed my sins, but now I got to face them one more time. No. Don't have time to explain all that today. But when the Holy Spirit talks about the judgment, he focuses on the bad guy who's going to get thrown out. The one who has caught us and put us in prison is going to get thrown out and we're going to get set free. And if you knew when you came to trial, you would be acquitted, would you want to delay the trial? No, let's have it today. I can get out tonight. So, I'm working through this, and I am ready. I get to preach it twice, 8.30 and 11 at my church. So, 8.30 service, I had a wonderful time preaching that sermon. I'm looking forward to 11.10. And at 11.10, when our church starts, I walk out, and I see about the third and fourth row on the right-hand side is wall-to-wall -wall with young adults. Young adults from a very conservative, 
educational institution. They're there because the next day, one of their own and another are getting married. And I realized I'm in trouble. They're not going to like this sermon. But I didn't care. I let them have it. I preached this for all I was worth, thoroughly enjoyed it, believe every word that I believe God had to say. And at the close of the sermon, I went to the back, went to the left, our door goes out that way, and I'm standing there shaking hands, happy Sabbath, thanks for coming. And sure enough, two of the young men from those two rows decided that I needed to be spoken to at the door, <clears throat> and they began to remonstrate with me that I had not preached what I needed to preach out of that passage. And it was quite a difficult conversation as I'm, I'm shaking hands, thanks for coming up. He said, yes, you know, and I'm trying to, I should have said just stand over there till later, but I really didn't want to deal with them later. I wanted to go home, have lunch, take a nap. I did not want to have an argument with them because I knew it wouldn't go anywhere. But I remember listening to them, you know, have you read, have you read this, have you read that? And what it really boiled down to was they were upset. They felt I had missed the mark because I had not preached about what we need to stop doing, what we need to start doing, and we better get with it because we're going to face the judgment. They even wanted to get together later in the afternoon and talk, and I said, no, this is it. And what I realized as I thought back on that, they were upset that I did not preach what was not in the passage. Did you get that? Double negative? I failed to preach what wasn't in the passage. And what I realized that they were saying was, yeah, but. I'm saying Jesus is enough, and they're saying, no, that's not enough. We got to deal with this, we got to deal with that, we got to have the fear of the judgment. Or we're just not going to get the job done. There are all kinds of subtle ways that we say, no, Jesus is not quite enough. The Christian world has an emphasis on hell. And you know, we as Adventists, we preach that hell brings an end to the misery rather than putting you in eternal misery. And I've actually had people say to me, well, if there's no hell, meaning no eternally burning hell, I had someone say, well, then why would people want to go to heaven? I'm thinking, boy, has the devil gotten a hold of you? Because, you know, the devil wants us to think that heaven is kind of an eternal church service. You know, we're going to go up there and we're going to be dressed in white with a band around there. You've seen the pictures, right? And the people are so happy. And the big people and the little people and everybody is so just standing around being just glorious. You know? And we sing another hymn and we have another sermon and a few more hymns. And this is just wonderful. And the devil gives us the idea that if you're going to have any fun, you better have it now because we're going to go to eternal boredom. Because after all, how can anybody have any fun when nobody can get hurt? You know, how can you have any fun when there's no risk? How can you have any fun when everything's so clean? And Satan wants us to think that you have a choice between burning and boredom. Well, I guess I'd take boredom over burning, wouldn't you? But I don't think we need... Well, what do I say? Scaring the, scaring the hell out of someone will not get them into heaven. And that was not swearing. You got that? Nobody's going to get into heaven because they want to get out of hell. The only reason you're ever going to be in heaven is, you, is if you want to be with Jesus. And this idea that love is not enough, Jesus is not enough, we have to have, to have that kicker of fear in order to get people to, oh yeah, maybe I better straighten up and fly right so I don't end up in the hot place. And the inference is, Jesus isn't quite enough. I disagree. I believe Jesus is enough. In the fall of 1974, Morris Vendon at Pacific Union College 
did a prayer meeting series on sanctifications by faith alone, and he focused on we work on relationship, God deals with the behavior. And every time after his short talk, people lined up 10 deep at the microphone, yeah, but don't we need to at least, yeah. In the late 1970s, I remember a guy named Jeffrey Paxton. He was an Anglican pastor educator from Australia. He somehow ran into an Adventist once and asked them something about what we believed on the gospel, and he got an answer. And then somehow he ran into another Adventist a few, de- a few days, weeks, months later, asked the same question, got a different answer. Well, that piqued them. They thought they believed this. No, they believed that. So he actually turned it into a project. And he ended up writing a book. He ended up interviewing all kinds of Adventists all over the world, church members, pastors, administrators, editors, authors, educators, professors, what we believed on the gospel. And the whole point of his book is that he got all these different answers that Adventists are all shook up about salvation and we don't really know what we believe. And he wrote this book called The Shaking of Adventism, the subtitle, the documented or a documented account of the crisis among Adventists over the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, I'll tell you something. I think there's only one thing wrong here, and that is the word justification should be replaced with sanctification. We haven't really disagreed on justification. It's what we do from there. Do we make sanctification by faith plus works, which he believed? Therefore, it has to be outside the gospel. And some Adventists put it in, some put it out, some have assurance, some don't. We're all shook up. It's never been over justification. It's been over sanctification. We preached on a Wednesday night. But that aside, he'd written this book. He actually came and did a lecture at PUC while I was there at Pacific Union College. But a little little time after Paxton came through and shook us up, an old Adventist preacher by the name of HMS Richards Sr. was in his mid-80s, and he came up to the campus for the weekend. Founder, speaker of the Voice of Prophecy, the longest continuously running Christian radio program on the air. Incredible man of God, preacher, innovator, and leader. And a man known for his short, simple, pithy answers. He's one of my heroes. Richards was Morris Venden's spiritual hero, as Morris Venden is my spiritual hero. HMS was up there one weekend. I don't know if it was this or another. He preached a sermon on Sabbath morning. I can still remember the whole thing. I could preach it again right now. To you. Simple, clear, deep, wonderful. Good man. Anyway, HMS Richards came up for the weekend to Pacific Union College, and for Sabbath school on that Sabbath morning, one of the theology teachers interviewed Elder Richards. And one of his interview questions was, Elder Richards, a man named Jeffrey Paxton wrote a book recently. He says Adventists are all shook up about what they believe. So, Elder Richards, in a few words, what is the Adventist message? Now, like I said, Richards is famous for saying a lot in few words. For instance, a lady once asked him, should women wear makeup? His answer was, if the barn needs painting, paint it. (laughs) A young man asked, should I become a pastor? He said, not if you can get out of it. And that's so true. (laughs) At one point, many years ago, 30 plus years ago, he was asked if women should be ordained to the gospel ministry. He said, as soon as we run out of men. And then he said, we have. I don't know what he meant. Morris Venden, when he was just going through his discovery of what it means and how you get to know Jesus, and was working through his feelings or his his understandings of righteousness by faith in Christ alone, wanted to get some wisdom from his spiritual hero. So Richards was speaking at a pastor's meeting, and when when he was getting done, Morris Venden placed himself right on the stairs to get off the stage. And when Richards came by, he said, Elder Richards, I'm a young pastor, and I'd I'd like to ask you a question. He said, what is it? He said, I have a question about righteousness by faith alone in Christ. 
Richard said, son, that's the only kind there is. Do you have any other question? <laughs> After Richards had had a stroke in the early 1980s, Morris Venden went to visit him. He said, Elder Richards, I'm going to be visiting all the camp meetings this summer that you and the Voice of Prophecy Quartet used to visit. Now, you've got to be pretty old to remember those days. He said, do you have any message you want me to give to the people? And Richard said, yes, tell the people the old man is still reading the Bible and it still says the same thing. (laughs) And tell them if they ever read that Richards has gone to his final resting place, don't believe it. Even if you read it in the review. (laughs) He didn't plan to be a final resting place. Anyway, back to the interview. Elder Richards. What is the Adventist message? And Richards instantly shot back, Jesus only. That's rich. I do believe that's true. I believe with our understanding of the Old Testament sanctuary, we see more of the gospel and more of the Bible than any other group that I know of. We don't believe that was works and this is faith and that was law and this is grace. We believe it's always been, from the very beginning, the everlasting gospel. There's only one gospel, Paul says. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ from beginning to end. The Old Testament shows it before the cross through the sanctuary. How do you explain the gospel when you can't mention the cross? Go to the sanctuary. We look forward. Now we look back. It's all about grace in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus only. He's absolutely right. Our biblical understanding facilitates a potential Jesus saturation beyond any other belief system. Jesus only. I like that. We're quick to agree on the surface, but do we really believe it? My cousin Lee submitted a book manuscript with a lot of the same concepts that we've been preaching on here um, to one of our publishing houses, and he got a letter back from a book editor there that said something like this, Lee You cannot stop at simply seeking to know Jesus better day by day. That's not enough. You still have to resist the devil by trying hard to stay out of trouble. Your message is too simple. It's not complete. Jesus is not quite enough. Now, I think maybe he was working from this passage, James 4, 7, and 8. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. So what are we supposed to do? We submit to God and we get over here and we kind of work up some oomph and then we go out and fight the devil, resist the devil a little bit and we run back to Jesus. Is that what we're supposed to do? I see it as kind of a relationship sandwich. When we submit and draw near to Jesus, resisting the devil will fit right in there. I mean, after all, are we any match for the devil? Are we even capable of resisting the devil? First of all, we can't see him. How are you going to fight a spirit? Only by having a bigger spirit fight the spirit. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our own sin problem is not our fight. The devil is our fight. And I want you to notice, we read that, resist the devil, and I think the back of our mind says resist sin. It doesn't say resist sin. It says resist the devil. And that's something I can't even do, except by submitting and hiding myself in Jesus. And when I'm hiding in Jesus, Satan won't even come close. And if I could see him, how would I resist him? He walks into the room towering to the ceiling. And I get a little macho, I'm going to show you something, mister. I'm going to look like a chihuahua barking at a loaded dump truck. (laughs) We end up backing off, trembling, defeated. I've had a few calls in my ministry that dealt with demon possession, and those are scary. I really don't like those appointments. But I'm the pastor, so I have to go, right? 
So I try to find another pastor, elder, or a few others too, as if we can gang up on the devil. We're going to be mincemeat if God doesn't do all the fighting. I told you the story of Steve Mackey, the world heavyweight boxing champion, kickboxing champion from the 1980s that Lee had a chance to uh, bring to Jesus. Shortly after their baptism of, of Ray and his wife, Lee and Margie Venden had Ray and his wife and son over to their house for Sabbath afternoon lunch. It was October 31. And they visited the entire afternoon away, and as the sun was setting, Lee said the phone rang. And on the other end, he recognized the voice of a 33-year-old woman. She'd been raised by parents who were practicing Satanists, and she was trying to get free from that. They'd visited several times and prayed. And her voice on the phone on Halloween night says, Pastor Venden, would you come to my house immediately right now? The devil is trying to kill me. No joke. Physically kill me. Please come now. And suddenly the voice on the phone changed to a guttural wolf-like growl that said, she's mine. She belongs to me. You can't have her. Don't pray for her. Don't talk about Jesus. She's mine. Click. Lee said the hair stood up on the back of his neck. His knees shook a little bit. Then he turned and noticed sitting near him the world heavyweight kickboxing champion. And he said, Steve, how would you like to go meet the devil? And Steve said something that he showed he hadn't been baptized quite long enough yet. He said, the vegetarian version being right on, I'd like to kick his behind. And Lee said, Steve, we're not going to kick anyone's behind, but I'd sure like to have someone come along and pray with me. He said, okay, you got it. Uh, Lee said, bring your sword. And Mackie said, sword? And Lee held up his Bible. And uh, Mackie said, right on, preach. They picked up their Bibles. They drove to the house. Everything was dark. They parked in the driveway. And Lee prayed, Jesus, I'm no match for the devil. We're no match for the devil. You got to go in ahead of us. We're just on your errand. Please, let's see you work. They went up to the door. They rang the bell. No answer. They knocked. No answer. They tried the door. It was unlocked. Opened it a little bit. Everything in the house was dark. Well, they decided they'd better go in and check it out. So you know the first thing they did, turn on lights. I don't know why we feel better around the devil with the lights on, but we do. Turn on the lights. They turned lights on. They looked through the house. They actually found the young lady in a, curled up in a fetal position on the floor in one of the bedrooms. Lee said he went over and shook her, said, we're here, and helped her get up. And they went in the living room, and Lee said she sat on one end of the couch. He sat on the very far other end, and Mackie sat across in a chair, kind of a triangle. Lee said, I looked at her, and I said, uh, you asked us to come and pray for you. The devil was trying to kill you. And at that moment, her lips started moving, and a voice came out that said, she's mine, all mine. You can't have her. She belongs to me. Don't pray. Don't talk about Jesus. She's mine. And Lee said, he tremblingly sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. And he looked over at the world heavyweight kickboxing champion who sang, for the Bible tells me so. And he, Lee said they started praying, and he said, Jesus still wins. The J team wins. Satan's no match. Eventually that growling, snarling voice went across the room and out the door. Later on, they're sitting in the car. And Lee said, well, Steve, what'd you think of that? And Steve said, when I sat down in that chair and I looked over at her, I had this uncanny feeling that someone else was looking at me through her eyes, boring a hole right into me. And he said, suddenly a fist slammed into my chest, forced out the air and held it there. I couldn't breathe. And a voice said in my ear, so you think you're going to kick my behind? <laughs> he said, that's when I sang, for the Bible tells me so. We are arrogant to think we're ever going to resist the devil. This is a relationship sandwich. We hang out in Jesus, and that's the best way to resist the devil. I'd like to suggest that we are to resist the power we're powerless to resist by connecting with a greater power the devil cannot resist. 
When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I mean, think of the Bible stories, people who tried to help God out. Abraham, he's told he's going to be the father of a numerous race, like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. He's getting older. It's been 10 years since the promise. Sarah says, I think God helps those that help themselves. I've got an idea. You take my slave. The child will be legally mine. We'll help God out with this problem. And of course, you know what happened. There's been trouble ever since. Jacob, he hears through his mom that even though he was promised the birthright by prophecy, Esau is going out to get some, some venison to feed to his father who's going to give him the birthright. And Jacob's mom says, I think God helps those that help themselves. We got to get in here and do our part. They deceive dad. Jacob gets the birthright, has to run for his life, never sees his mother alive again. Moses is told he's going to lead Israel out of Egypt. Okay, you got the right guy, Lord. I graduated from the highest military schools on earth. I've been victorious in multi, multiple military campaigns. I'm fluent in several languages. Let's get started. He kills one Egyptian and ends up herding sheep for 40 years. At the end of 40 years, God shows up in a burning bush and says, now, J Moses, about those Israelites. And Moses said, he got the wrong guy. I can't even talk. God says, now we're going to get somewhere. Finally. Uzzah. Poor Uzzah. All he wanted to do was keep the ark from falling off the cart. And God knocks him dead. David was mad. <laughs> but you know, if God had not reacted decisively, the ark would have just become another pagan god propped up by human hands. Remember Dagon of the Philistines? Falls over in front of the ark. Big, mighty, tough Dagon. They had to go in and set him back up again. And the next thing you know, he's fallen over again. His hands are broken off. They had to glue Dagon back together. Now Uzzah's going to keep the ark from falling. And if God hadn't have acted decisively, it looks like the ark's just another pagan god that human beings prop up. I have a dream about Uzzah. My dream for Uzzah is that he comes up in the first resurrection. And God says, Uzzah, I know your heart was good. I know you meant well. But I had to do it, and here's why. Welcome home. That's my dream for Uzzah. I hope to meet Uzzah in heaven. But the point of these stories is every time we try to help God out and add a little bit to what he's doing, all we do is make a mess. Somewhere along the line, we all generally agree the justification is by faith alone. Forgiveness of God, the free gift, you can't earn it, it's all by faith. But the sanctification is somehow me working on obedience and victory in a character like Christ. As if it's something I produce or help produce. But as we've discussed it, it has to be by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Where he does it all, I simply seek him. Therefore, the gospel continues to be, sanct continues to be by grace alone through faith in Jesus. Both in getting saved and in being saved and in living saved and in going on into eternity. I mean, this idea that we're going to, you know, with God's help, work on getting better and better until someday, hopefully, we'll get in one good day before Jesus comes. How's it going? How's it going? If I told you, you can have any car you want, no money down, what would you ask? What are the monthly payments? $5,000 a month for the rest of your life. Would you want the car? You know, if I bought you a million dollar Lamborghini and put $500,000 down on it, I'd given you 500,000. All you have to do is pay the other 500,000, that'll sink you. And that's kind of been our view of salvation. Justification is free, now get on with obedience. I can't make the monthly installments. I can't make the daily payments. This idea of steadily overcoming one sin after another doesn't work, we have to let Jesus have our hearts and let him deal with anger and pride and lust and envy and impatience. 
Let him deal with the 10th commandment that says don't even think about it. He promises if we'll let him begin the good work, he'll what? It doesn't say help us complete it. It says he will complete it. He will finish what he starts. Philippians 2.13, it's God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Notice God is working in you to both make good choices and bring them to pass. It's the one-two punch that knocks the enemy out. He chooses, he does. Now let's put that in context. Therefore, beloved, as you have always obeyed, now in my presence only, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, dear. Why did you say that, Paul? I'm going to join Peter. He said some things hard to understand. Now, please notice, work out your own salvation in with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and do his good pleasure. I wish Paul had put those in reverse order. God is working in you to will and do of his pleasure so that you can work out that salvation in your daily living. The only way I'm going to have good stuff come out is if God has done good stuff inside. I believe that working out of our salvation is this amazing thing that we live by the power of God, and that's an awesome thing. We get to live out what he does inside when we sit at the feet of Jesus. I believe that's what that's talking about. He will will and do of his good pleasure, and it'll come out in a whole new lifestyle. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I believe that's that's saying exactly the same thing. When he transforms the inside, our lives now become a living demonstration that his ways are good and acceptable and perfect, and you ought to do it too. Satan says, no, you don't want it. Jesus says, go out and live it for me so they can see it's real. When Jesus does an inside work, it comes out. God does the inner work, the willing, the doing, the transforming of the mind so that we get to live it out, work it out in transformed behavior. We get to experience life, the living reality of what it means to live God's way, and we get to reveal that life as living proof to the rest of the world that those ways are good. So what happens when people decide to trust God to do what he says will do. We looked at some examples of people who thought they needed to help God out a little bit. Jesus isn't quite enough. Well, what about people who finally fully trust God? Moses gets to the Red Sea with the two million Israelites. The Egyptian army is coming in. They are literally between the devil and the deep blue sea. There's no way they can go anywhere. They are up for slaughter. The people start panicking. God says to Moses, hold out your rod. That rod didn't part the sea. But when he held out the rod, the sea was parted. And the people walked through on dry land, and God solved the problem all by himself. Right down to drowning the army. Israel shows up at Jericho. They walk around the walls and shout. And the people in Jericho had to wonder, what in the world are these people doing, walking around shouting? And then the walls fell down. And the people took Jericho by everybody walking straight in. The walls were gone. And God did the victory in Jericho all by himself. Jonathan is his armor bearer. All the Israelites are hiding in the caves and the cliffs. And Jonathan looks up and there's the Philistines on the top of a butte. And he says to his armor bearer, let's go get them. (laughs) That's a suicide mission. The armor bearer said, I'm with you. They're going up. Okay, God, if you want us to go on up, have them invite us up. (laughs) Okay. They say, hey, come on up. So they went up, and they won a great victory. They won a great victory. Two guys against an entire army. God can handle it all by himself. The, the, the The Philistines ended up killing each other off. Hezekiah is invaded by the huge army of Assyria. No kingdom had ever beat Assyria. And now Hezekiah has this Syrian army saying, just give up. You can't win. 
we'll take you to another land where you'll live just fine and, you know, just, just capitulate. Write a letter. They wrote a letter. Hezekiah takes the letter in and puts it in the sanctuary before God. He says, now what do we do? And God essentially said, let me handle it. And I love the way the Bible says it. It came to pass that night. The angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score and 5,000, 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Kind of a funny way the King James puts that. They arose and they were all dead. Um, do you realize, folks, that was the end of the Assyrian nation? From then on, they went in decline. God handled Assyria all by himself. He's pretty good at it. Gideon starts with what? 32,000 men, gets down to 10,000. Finally, he gets down to 300. God says, now we can do something. You won't think you did it. What did they take? A torch, a pitcher, and a trumpet. They, they don't even have anything to fight with. And 300 of them run into the middle of the camp. That's a suicide mission. And they all kill, the, they kill each other. No, nobody in Gideon's army dies. And God beats the enemy all by himself. Jehoshaphat. He's invaded by a triple alliance, Moab, Ammon, and Edom. And he takes, he goes to God and he says, look, when we came in as the children of Israel many centuries ago into the land of Israel, you wouldn't let us take out Ammon, Moab, and Edom because you said they're our cousins. Now they've ganged up to take us out. God, this is your problem. And they got together for a prayer meeting. And a prophet said, don't be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude. The battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. You will not need to fight in this battle. You don't have to fight. You just get to watch. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Don't fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them. But notice, not to fight, just to watch. For the Lord is with you. So what did they decide to do? They sent the choir out first. How would you like to be in that choir? If this thing doesn't work out, you're the first to go. I'd at least want to be a bass in the back row. And they went out, and those three different armies turned on each other until they wiped themselves out. It says not a man survived. God handled it all by himself. Jesus is enough. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Notice, Jesus is all of those things to us. Wisdom from God, we wouldn't even have the ability to comprehend the problem or the solution if he didn't give us that ability. He's our righteousness, our justification, our super forgiveness. He is our sanctification, holiness, and character transformation. It's not a little of him and a lot of us or a lot of him and a little of us. It's all him. And he's our redemption. Morris Venden used to say, you know, we don't have any problem with justification because Jesus alone. He saves us, forgives us. We don't have any problem with redemption. We're not going to flap our arms and help get ourselves to heaven. So then why do we jump on the one in between and think we're going to help with that one? It's all Jesus. Jesus is enough. He's the whole package. Now, if Jesus is the whole package, then what do I need to do? Get with the package and stay with the package, right? Get with Jesus and stay with Jesus. Take time alone with him. Commune with him. Spill over to others about him. The one thing God will not and cannot do for us is to spend time with himself seeking relationship. If he did, it would violate our freedom of choice. If he did, it would be like, I don't know, hugging or kissing yourself. It's just not very fulfilling. Relationships can't be unilateral. Some people are afraid that looking to Jesus just won't quite be enough. They're worried that we need to help God out a little bit. A little of our willpower, backbone, grit, and determination. Cold showers, gimmicks, behavior modification techniques. If the eye is fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed to his image. What's the key? Fix your eye. Notice the previous verse. 
He who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. We don't give God all the glory because he did most of it. We give him all the glory because he did all of it. Morris Venden, back in 1975, <clears throat> he decided to teach a Bible class at Pacific Union College, and the class met at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, he does, wasn't just a sick guy with a bad idea. His idea was 6 in the morning, he won't have any of the hangers on hers. He won't have any of the idol. He'll have only there the ones that actually want to be there. And the goal of the class those who don't have the assurance of eternal life, show them how they can have it. Those who have a walk with Jesus, show them how it can be deeper. In that class, Morris Venden made a challenge. He said, if you will take the next two weeks and every day spend at least 15 minutes reading your Bible to know Jesus, talking to him in prayer, and then sometime during that day, tell somebody something that you got out of that. He said, if you do that, I promise you something significant will happen in your life. So I've talked to some who did. And of course, what was his goal? First of all, he can't guarantee that, but the Bible does say draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You take one step towards him, he'll take a giant leap towards you. And what's the greatest thing that could happen if you spent two weeks, 15 minutes a day with Jesus and bubbled over to somebody? The greatest thing that could happen is you go another two weeks and another two weeks and two months and two years and two decades and you walk with Jesus the rest of your life. I want to issue you a challenge as we close. I want to issue you that same two-week challenge. That you decide that you're going to give at least 15 minutes a day to Jesus every day for the next two weeks. Read your Bible and talk to Jesus for at least 15 minutes, and then during the day, bubble over to somebody about something that you experienced. Okay? Now, here's a way to look at it. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send around a uh, legal pad on both sides, and I'm going to ask you if you want to join this challenge... Just put your first name down. God knows your last name, all right? I only want your first name. And then I want you to put a 15 if you want to commit 15 minutes a day to spend with Jesus. The thought there is, if you haven't been, then start out at 15. Don't start out with 45 or an hour. It takes some time to get into it. 15. Now, if you're already spending time with Jesus, instead of putting a 15 down, you can put a plus sign, which says for the next two weeks, I want to increase my time with Jesus. If you want to, you could put a number after that. I want to increase it to 30 or 60 or 90 or 47 or whatever minutes you want. And there's a fourth category. I know some people do this. I got a few people in my church doing it now. They've chosen to tithe their time to Jesus every day which works out to be 144 minutes, two hours and 24 minutes. Give a tenth of your day. I've got several church members now who said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to tithe my time. Some that really surprised me, they said that. It's like, that one? Those? So here's what I want to do. You do not have to do this, but I would like to challenge you to put your name First name, a 15, a plus, if you want to add a number after that, great, or tithe, just put that down. And here's my promise to you. For the next two weeks, I commit to pray for you by name, according to your commitment, every single day, okay? I will pray for you every day if you make this commitment, and my prayer will be that something significant happens in your spiritual life such that this becomes an ongoing habit for the rest of your days. But you can only do it one day at a time, and a two-week commitment is kind of a way of saying, okay, let's do this thing together for a couple of weeks. You know, you might wake up tomorrow morning and say, I don't feel like, oh, but I made a commitment, okay. I mean, there is something to making commitments and working as a team. So, I'm gonna let that go around. I encourage you all who are willing and want to, 
First name, and either 15, a plus. If you want to, you can put another time frame you're thinking of, or if you want to put down tithe and spend 144 minutes with Jesus for the next two weeks every day. And I promise to commit to pray for you every single day. All right? I'm going to continue while you're doing that. A pastor friend was pastoring a rural church out in the Midwest. And one morning as he was beginning his sermon, a couple walked in the back door and came in and sat down. And the thing the pastor noticed was the way they were dressed didn't look like they had going to church on their mind when they decided to get up and get dressed that morning. And they had the heavy fragrance of tobacco. The pastor preached on a personal acquaintance with Jesus. And at the close of the sermon, the man shook the pastor's hand at the door. He had long hair, he had a beard, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said to the pastor, would you come to my house and teach my wife and I how to know Jesus for ourselves? And the pastor said, of course. And he decided to do exactly that. Instead of taking a set of Bible lessons out and covering the doctrines, he decided to just do what they asked. So he went out, he said, and he began to read the Gospel of John with them. That's all they did, read the Gospel of John. He said he sat there between two people who had a cigarette lit constantly. He figured he smoked a pack and a half just reading the Gospel of John each evening. But they kept at it. He met with them once a week, and all they did was talk about Jesus. The funny thing, as time went on, they were coming to church now. Their appearance began to change. He noticed they began to tithe, and he'd never talked about tithing. He noticed they began keeping the Sabbath, and he'd never preached on the Sabbath. In fact, the man was so convicted on the Sabbath, he told the pastor, he said, you know, I'm a dry land farmer. I have to take the irrigation when it comes. And sometimes it comes on Sabbath and sometimes it comes other days. And he said, I was dropping my tractor, plowing the field the other day, and I finally just had to kneel down, get off, stop the tractor, get off the tractor, kneel down in the dirt and say, okay, God, I will not take the irrigation on Sabbath anymore. You'll have to watch over my crops. I've let a, met a lot of long-term Adventists who don't have the guts to do that. By the way, he never lost a crop. And then one day, the pastor noticed they'd quit smoking. And he hadn't talked to them about smoking. So he got suspicious. And he wondered, have some of the folks been talking to them about the rules and regulations of the church? And so he tried to gently ask, you know, I've noticed some changes in you guys. Have the folks down at the church been telling you stuff? She said, like what? And the pastor spoke of the, their appearance, how they dressed. She said, what else? They talked about some other things. Finally, what else? He said, well, smoking. Has anyone told you we don't approve of smoking? And she looked over at her husband, and she said to him, when's the last time you had a cigarette? And he said, I don't remember. When's the last time you had a smoke? She said, I don't know. She said, I didn't even realize we had stopped smoking. I guess Jesus took the desire away. Is Jesus enough? I believe Jesus is enough. And if we would give our focus on him and give him time, he can straighten us out. You know, he might choose to work on issue A in your life while he's working on issue B in your life and C in your life and D in your life. And we've decided... D needs to come first, and you got to get rid of D before you can get baptized. 
and maybe E, but God's doing A. And I had one lady one time, this is 20 years ago now, 20 some years ago. She was coming to my church. She went through an evangelistic series and I was watching God transform her life in so many areas, but she was still smoking. I struggle with that because this was a time when I was having a little bit of opposition and I knew if I baptized someone who was still smoking, I was going to get in trouble with some elders. I finally came to the point where I had to say it is very clear that God is working in her life and she has surrendered her life to Jesus. He just hadn't gotten around to that sin yet. And I baptized her. And then I started praying, Lord, don't let anybody see her smoking. Clear her breath, you know. Don't let anybody. It was two years at camp meeting. She was at camp meeting. She came into an early morning prayer time one morning and says, well, God told me it's him or cigarettes, so there go the cigarettes. And she never smoked again. God can get around what needs to be gotten around to if we just help people walk with Jesus he can take it from there. I'm not saying we never talk about the Sabbath. I'm not saying we never talk about behavior or standards. But let God be in charge of that stuff. Instead of us thinking we've got to manage it and figure it all out. People want to talk to me sometimes about, well, you know, do you have to do this for baptism? What do you do? And they don't want to argue this. And I have to say, you know, I believe every human being is individual. Every human being is unique. And I have to work with everyone individually. And I have to ask God how to work with each person. Because I believe that Jesus is enough. Are you troubled or confused? He's the wonderful counselor. Are you tense? He's the prince of peace. Are you uncertain? He's the cornerstone in the solid rock. Are you let down? He's faithful. Are you lonely? He's the friend that's closer than a brother. Are you defenseless? He's the advocate. Are you in the dark? He's the light. Are you surrounded by difficulties? He's the deliverer. Are you sinful? He is our righteousness. Are you helpless? He is our savior. Are you bereaved? He's the resurrection and the life. Are you hungry? He's the bread of life. Are you thirsty? He's the day spring and the living water. Are you searching? He's the way, truth, and the life. Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He's the creator of all and the keeper of creation. He's the architect of the universe, the manager of time. He always was, always is, and always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He is light, he is love, he is longevity, he is Lord. He is goodness, he is gentleness, he is grace, he is guide, he is God, he is holy, he is righteous, he is mighty, he is powerful, he is pure. He is savior, he is sanctifier, he is redeemer, he is friend, he is peace, he is joy, he is comfort, he is hope. He's eternal, he's the ancient of days, he's the ruler of rulers, he's the king of kings, the world can't understand him, armies can't defeat him, schools can't explain him, leaders can't ignore him, Pharisees couldn't confuse him, Herod couldn't kill him, Nero couldn't crush him, Hitler couldn't silence him, and the new age can't replace him. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you, he will never forget you, he will never mislead you, he will never overlook you. When you fall, he will lift you up. When you fail, he will forgive. When you're weak, he is strong. When you're lost, he's the way. When you're afraid, he is courage. When you stumble, he is steady. When you're hurt, he heals. When you're broken, he mends. When you're blind, he leads. When you're hungry, he feeds. When you face persecution, he'll shield you. When you face problems, he'll comfort you. When you face loss, he'll provide for you. When you face death, he will hold you. He's the resurrection. He holds the keys of the grave. He is everything for everyone, every time, everywhere, every way. He is God. He is faithful. And I would say he is enough. And with a pedigree like that, go figure, he wants to be your friend. He's actually more eager to be our friend than we are to be his friend.
You'd think we'd be beating down heaven's gates to respond to an invitation to friendship like that. But we're so busy with stuff that rusts and burns that we don't have time for him. The guy who left heaven in order to rescue us and give us the chance to get off this planet alive. He numbers the hairs of our head because he's that interested in us. He's totally interested with our details in our life. He cares totally. And that, I believe, is the Adventist message. Jesus only. He is enough Paul says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord that I may know him. He says, can we be friends? Come on, let's hang out. Watch what I'll do for you. I am eager for us to become the best of friends. And we end where we started a week ago Friday night. Jesus says, do you love me? Can we be friends? And with that friendship comes everything. Forgiveness and assurance of eternal life, holiness and real transformation, and eternity where abiders today will abide with him forever. Amen.